Administrators at for-profit colleges don't have easy jobs. True, since the Obama administration uncovered large amounts of fraud and high rates of students defaulting on their federal loans, they've faced really harsh scrutiny from federal and state governments. But there are other challenges unique to this sector as well. Some education experts believe that, due to the inherent nature of these struggles, for-profit colleges should be done away with altogether. My name is Henry Kronk, editor at eLearning Inside, and this week on Ed Technically, I'm going to explore those challenges and then detail how some for-profits are pivoting to a non-profit slash OPM model, a new technique used to maintain business as usual. Some viewers might be saying for-profit colleges, that's not exactly Ed Tech. And they would be right, kind of. In response, I'll say that to make this pivot, for-profits are fitting themselves into new corners of the edtech industry with a focus on online courses and online program management. Okay, let's go. For-profit colleges operate with most of their eggs in just one basket. Unlike their nonprofit counterparts, the vast majority of their revenue comes from tuition and fees. According to the latest data from the National Center for Education Statistics, known as NCES, for-profits on average receive 90% of their total gross revenue from what students pay them. Tuition and fees also account for the single largest revenue source at private nonprofits, but there it only accounts for 39% of their total. The biggest revenue stream for public nonprofits, meanwhile, at 43%, is government grants and contracts and appropriations. And at nonprofits, there are also countless other streams of revenue. There are endowments, there are hospitals run by the universities that are bringing in revenue. There is research and development teams working with tech companies. There are countless other ways that nonprofit colleges make money. However, at for profits, it's really mostly students. Ask any MBA student, and they'll tell you that a diversified portfolio is far preferable. For profits, of course, know this firsthand because, according to that same NCES data, their primary revenue source has decreased by 5% between 2010 and 2015. That also corresponds to when the Obama administration began investigating the sector, by the way. When Red Inc. makes its way onto the quarterly earnings report, for-profits need to face harsh critics, known as shareholders. Most of the largest for-profit colleges are operated as or owned by publicly traded companies. Thomas Corbett, a former executive at numerous for-profit colleges, including Kaplan University, University of Phoenix, and ITT Technical Institute, recently wrote an opinion piece for Inside Higher Ed describing the dangers of relaxing federal oversight on for-profit colleges. He writes, quote, It is important that the Education Department recognize the pressures inside a company to demonstrate to Wall Street that it is increasing enrollment growth while decreasing costs and increasing profit. The truth is that educating students is costly, and it is a cost that is the easiest to slash when a company wants to cut expenses and increase profits. Our company had a bifurcated culture. To the outside world, we presented an external appearance of concern for the students and compliance with federal requirements. But inside the company, students were viewed as potential sales targets, and our internal communications focused on, quote, sales production, end quote, rather than student needs. The real guidance was that behind closed doors, we were to do anything and say anything to convince students to enroll and sign the loan package. Every employee even at the highest levels, had recruitment metrics set by headquarters and closely monitored with the threat of termination if those metrics weren't met. Weekly emails to all campuses compared our recruitment numbers." End quote. On the current regulatory side, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has no qualms about this unique situation. In fact, she has made it her mission in office to roll back numerous regulations placed on for-profit institutions by the former administration. 
DeVos has increased barriers for the loan forgiveness program set up for students defrauded by for-profits. She has rolled back the rules requiring for-profits to report how many of their graduates land jobs in their fields of study and repay their federal loans. Opposing the opinions of many DOE staff, she reinstated Department Recognition of an Accreditor, ACICS, that allowed numerous for-profits to operate. Uh, most recently, she has made plans to relax the requirements among online and distance education programs for what constitutes regular and substantive contact between instructors and students. This was a regulation that was put in place when online courses really became viable in the mid-aughts. DeVos has also made plans to eliminate the minimum requirements for how much time a college must spend educating a student. In other words, she is making it easier for for-profit colleges to do what they do. But for many of these colleges, this has been too little too late. In December, the Education Corporation of America announced it was closing 70 colleges across the U.S. In September, Harrison College closed each of its 11 campuses in Indiana, Ohio, and North Carolina. And in July, Dream Center Education Holdings announced it would be closing 30 campuses across the U.S. All of these are for-profit educators. The online publication Education Dive is currently tracking institution closings, mergers, and acquisitions. They report that since 2016, when many Obama administration regulations went into full effect, more than 74 profits have been closed, acquired, or consolidated. Many, such as ITT Technical Institute or Brown Mackey College, were massive chains that operated over 100 campuses. Facing defeat, a few for-profits have come up with a strategy for survival. Credit for this strategy should be given to Kaplan University, which in 2017 was owned by Graham Holdings. Many boilermakers were shocked when they heard that their university, one of the best American public institutions, had bought Kaplan University for the sum of $1. As summarized in Purdue's 2018 financial report, Quote, on April 27, 2017, Purdue Global entered into a contribution and transfer agreement to receive the institutional assets and operations of Kaplan University in exchange for cash consideration of $1 and a covenant to enter into a long-term transition and operations support agreement under which Kaplan Higher Education will provide key non-academic operations support to Purdue Global." End quote. Now, selling an entire for-profit university that, at the time, counted 32,000 students for $1 in exchange for a service contract, that sounds like a terrible deal. Many analysts, in fact, have since expressed the belief that Graham Holdings took on most of the risk involved and even left money on the table. But as chairman of Graham Holdings, one Donald Graham, explained to Ed Surge at the time, quote, why did Purdue not start an online university of its own? You have to figure out, how do we attract students in a world where if you Google online education or online bachelor's degrees, there's a lot of people out there? How do you recruit them? How do you offer them financial aid? How do you counsel them? How do you run a place that attracts lots of students and explains the program to them? In other words, what Graham was saying was, how do you manage the online program? How do you become an online program manager? Here's another way to look at the situation. Students are really demanding clients. They demand a quality education, health services, mental health services, counseling, dorms, cafeterias, campuses that are cleaned, powered, and regularly refurbished, and so, so many other services required to operate an institution of higher education. And if you, as a for-profit college that takes in 9 out of every $10 you make from those students, begin to let them down, they're going to transfer somewhere else. Nonprofit universities, on the other hand, are much more dependable clients. In fact, they'll sign contracts that last years. At the same time, many for profits were and continue to be way ahead of public nonprofits when it comes to online education. Many for profits were early adopters of online courses. The University of Phoenix first went online way back in 1989. 
To highlight this point further, in 2015, again according to NCES data, over 1.3 million Americans attended a for-profit college. More than 750,000 of them were pursuing their degree entirely online. So that's over half of for-profit students were purely online. By comparison, just 1.45 million of the 14.5 million public university students were taking their degree ex exclusively online. Considering that demand for online education has been increasing for 14 straight years, according to the Babson Survey Research Group, one might say that public universities have some catching up to do. So there's a word for Kaplan University's role at Purdue, which is known officially as Purdue Global University. And that role is online program manager. As Graham described above, Purdue now contracts Kaplan to take care of various services for their online students. They also likely provide them with the extensive digital infrastructure required to teach tens of thousands of people online. Since Kaplan University first initiated their nonprofit conversion slash OPM spinoff in 2017, two other notable groups have begun to do the same thing. They are Grand Canyon University and Bridgepoint Education. In both cases, instead of selling their for-profit college to an existing public university, the two companies have sought to convert their existing institutions into nonprofits while maintaining their original companies as OPMs. The GCU conversion was completed last July. The Bridgepoint deal is still underway. These companies are getting a chance to have their cake and eat it too. They have shed the toxic for-profit brand while gaining much more reliable clients. The universities in turn no longer need to answer to shareholders to operate and can turn their focus to educating their students. So that's what's happening and here's why it matters. While the IRS now recognizes the newly minted nonprofits and OPMs as individual entities, it isn't so black and white. Robert Shireman, former Department of Education regulator under the Obama administration, obtained details of the Kaplan Agreement through a Freedom of Information Act request. As he writes for the Chronicle of Higher Education, quote, Kaplan's role with Purdue going forward will be akin to that of an online program management company, or OPM, but on steroids. The list of responsibilities on the Kaplan side of this partnership is unusually long, including editorial services, marketing and advertising, front-end student advising, admissions support services, international student recruitment, test preparation, technology support, business office, financial aid and student aid, human resources, facilities and property management, finance and accounting, and general administrative functions. Former for-profit efforts in the marketing, counseling, and advertising at these universities was precisely what drew the criticism of regulators in the first place. The fraud generally committed by for-profits involved misleading students about what the institution could offer them, misleading them about the success of their graduates and about their ability to pay off student loan debt. And as Thomas Corbett related above, employees at all levels were tasked with recruiting new students at any cost. It was these practices that some say brought about such high rates of student loan default among for-profit borrowers in the first place. As Shireman paraphrased for the Denver Post, quote, most of the recent conversions of for-profits to non-profits have been wolves in sheep's clothing, end quote. This has been Ed Technically. My name is Henry Kronk, and I work as the editor of eLearning Inside. If you liked this episode, please rate and review. If you want to hear more, please subscribe. Also, keep in mind that this show is available as a video on our YouTube channel and also as a podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. The basic content for this video first appeared as an article on eLearning Inside, and if you want to learn more about online courses, technology in the classroom, and edtech in general, be sure to check out our site. It's updated daily. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please send me an email to henry at elearninginside.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at elearninginside. Thanks for listening.